when I placed my head upon my pillow, I did not sleep, nor could I be said to think. I saw with shut eyes but acute mental vision. I saw the pale student of unhallowed arts kneeling beside the thing he had put together. I saw the hideous phantasm of a man stretched out and then, on the working of some powerful engine, show signs of life and stir with an uneasy, half-vital motion. A short-sleeved linen chemise was worn next to the skin to protect the outer garments from sweat. Knitted stockings in wool, linen, or silk were worn pulled up over the knee. A silk ribbon garter was tied below the knee to keep the stocking smooth and in place. A new type of undergarment, called a pair of pantalets, was worn. This comprised two separate tubular legs connected by a drawstring at the waist. Not every woman wore them, and not all the time either, just when an extra layer was required for modesty or warmth. Corded stays were worn to raise the bust. This was a transitional garment, and as such, corded stays varied in length, style of fastening, materials, and decoration, but they were functional, comfortable, and often very pretty. A linen petticoat was worn over this to disguise the line of the stays and to provide an extra layer to cover the legs. Gowns were high-waisted and could have either front or back fastening. They were occasionally buttoned, but mostly they were closed by a couple of hooks and eyes, and a drawstring at the neck and waist to pull the gown in to fit. Indian muslin fabrics in simple block print patterns were fashionable, as were English cottons with their more complicated roller print designs. Long sleeves could be added for cooler days, and these were tacked onto a concealed undersleeve of linen. Flat leather pumps, often with crisscross lacings, were worn. A stole could be added for warmth, or to add a contrasting color to an outfit. In the summer of 1816, Mary Godwin and Percy Shelley joined Lord Byron and other friends at Villa Diodati on the shores of Lake Geneva. Thunderstorms and torrential rain forced guests to remain inside the villa. The unseasonal weather had been caused by a volcanic eruption in Indonesia, which had sent ash billowing into the atmosphere, blocking the sun. One candlelit evening around the log fire Byron challenged the company to write a ghost story. As thunderstorms rolled around the mountains and lightning flashed constantly across the lake, the party sat discussing their ideas until late into the night. Mary was quiet, observing rather than participating in the discussion. That night she was plagued with nightmares and slept but little. I could not so easily get rid of my hideous phantom. Still, it haunted me. I must try to think of something else. I recurred to my ghost story. My tiresome, unlucky ghost story. 
If I could only contrive one which would frighten my reader as I myself had been frightened that night. Swift as light and as cheering was the idea that broke upon me. I have found it. What terrified me will terrify others, and I need only describe the spectre which had haunted me my midnight pillow. On the morrow I announced that I had thought of a story. I began that day with the words, It was on a dreary night of November, making only a transcript of the grim terrors of my waking dream. It was on a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of my toils with an anxiety that almost amounted to agony. I collected the instruments of life around me that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. It was already one in the morning. The rain pattered dismally against the panes and my candle was nearly burnt out, when by the glimmer of the half-extinguished light I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open. It breathed hard and a convulsive motion agitated its limbs. How can I describe my emotions at this catastrophe? Or how delineate the wretch whom with such infinite pains and care I had endeavoured to fall. His limbs were in proportion, and I had selected his features as beautiful. Beautiful, good God! His yellow skin scarcely covered the world. Mary Godwin was not yet 20 years old. Her brilliant mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, had died giving birth to her. Mary had eloped with Shelley when she was just 17, and they had already lost their firstborn daughter. They now had an infant son, and later in 1860 they were to marry. Mary knew much of death and life, and in the extraordinary atmosphere at the villa, this exceptional young woman created one of the most enduring horror stories of all time. It was published in 1818 and has never been out of print. The Modern Prometheus or Frankenstein. When by the dim and yellow light of the moon, as it forced its way through the winter shutters, I beheld the wretch, the miserable monster whom I had created. He held up the curtain of the bed, and his eyes, if eyes they may be called, were fixed on me. His jaws opened, and he muttered some inarticulate sounds. While a grin wrinkled his cheeks, he might have spoken, but I did not hear. One hand was stretched out seemingly to detain me, but I escaped and rushed downstairs, I took refuge in the courtyard belonging to the house which I inhabited, where I remained during the rest of the night, walking up and down in the greatest agitation, listening attentively, catching and fearing each sound, as if it were to announce the demoniacal corpse to which I had so miserably given life.